Well, hello there and welcome to School of the Spirit. I'm so excited to come your way again through this platform. And I believe that, especially for those of us who have been following the series uh, over time, I believe that you have been edified, that you have been blessed, and that you have been experiencing transformation. You know, knowledge is um, a catalyst for personal transformation. The amount of information you receive determines uh, and the understanding of that information determines the level of transformation that happens to an individual. And I believe that the greatest miracle uh, for mankind will be the miracle of transformation, that we are able to evolve into superior versions of ourselves, especially in our spiritual journey and our walk with God. In fact, uh, God prescribed His plan for us, for our growth and for our transformation. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, He said that as we behold Him as an image in a mirror, He says, as we behold the glory of God, we are changed from glory to glory by the Spirit of God. So we keep going from one dimension of glory, one dimension of the experience. The glory of God is the nature of God. It's all that God is and have. So we keep going in experience from one dimension after another. And what precedes this experience is the knowledge, the illumination that we receive from the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. And so I believe that if you've been following up till this point, you have really um, experienced a spiritual and a mental shift, radical shift in your life. And I believe that as we continue on this journey, um, soon we will look back and realize how we have evolved so speedily within a very short time because it is as we are transformed that we become better and more efficient vessels in the hands of the Creator. That being said, I'd like us to say a short word of prayer and then we'll begin today. Today is going to be exciting. I promise you, it's going to be great. Father, thank you for you are the Father of light. The light that comes from you is what lightens our life, is what guarantees our transformation. That light is knowledge. That light is understanding. That light is illumination. That light is revelation. And I ask that it be dispensed to us today by the help of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in once again. Now, we have taken time to talk about prayer um, again and again. Um, not too long ago, we finished a series on prayer. Uh, we talked about transformation by prayer and how that prayer is a major component in the evolution of a believer. Uh, we talked about about five to six different stages of transformation. And I thought that we were done with prayer so we can move to another thing, another subject to discuss because like this program is school of the spirit it's strictly about the spiritual you know paul said in first corinthians chapter 12 verse 1 when he wrote to the corinthian church he said consigning the spiritual if you read it in king james translation the word spiritual is italicized is in an italicized form that means that uh, or the word gifts rather it's in an italicized form that means that in the original manuscripts, that word gift was not there. So if you remove the word gift, this is how it will read. Now consigning the spiritual, I will have you not ignorant. So God wants us to be fully informed about the realm of the Spirit, about the person of the Holy Spirit, uh, so that we can grow spiritually because we are intelligent uh, concerning the spiritual so a lot has been talked about in prayer but I felt the Lord stirred up my heart to still take us 
a journey further in the discussion of prayer. Now, the truth is, I can tell you uh, for a fact that you, you really cannot exhaust prayer. It looks like it's the lifeline of a believer. It's the culture of Christianity. Everything about Christianity revolves around prayer. You know, basically prayer uh, is connected with communication, spiritual communications. And you see, uh, the world that we live in today, this 21st century jet age, is, um, is it evolves around communication. Everything is interacting with everything. Man interacting with his environment, um, plants interacting with themselves, uh, technology, man interacting with technology, with innovation, with development. Its communication is, is the synergy of all things. And so um, it's a science that uh, really doesn't have an end. And so when we bring it into the spiritual, knowing that communications, as far as God is concerned in the kingdom, revolves around prayer, then you'll agree with me that there is no end to discussing on this subject again and again. But this time around, we are going to look at something very interesting. And I would like to title it, Finding God in Prayer. We want to discuss an aspect of prayer again that I believe will help you in your journey with God. You know, God will not have us ignorant about anything. He wants us to be informed. The Bible says in Colossians 1 verse 9 that we will be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that we will walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him and abounding in every good work. So God wants us to be fully informed. And I believe that this dimension and this approach that we want to discuss concerning prayer will really help you in your work with God. It will help you develop an intimate relationship with God. And it will help you begin to understand the science of communication in prayer, the science of spiritual communication with God that is factored in prayer. And that means it's going to tune up your spiritual perceptions and your senses will come alive. So we want to talk about finding God in prayer. We are discussing intimacy. Now, I will read two scriptures for us and then we will begin. Primarily, uh, prayer was designed to develop our relationship with God. You know, relationship is different from fellowship. We are related with God because of what Jesus Christ has done. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 verse 8 that by Him we have access to the Father through one Spirit. Jesus has bridged the gap between divinity and humanity. And we are now children of God because we have the life of God in us. But just like it is possible in the natural to be related to someone you have never met and you have never had any dealings with, it is also possible to have a relationship with God and still don't know God. That is why you must transcend from relationship to fellowship. Fellowship is the phenomenon that lubricates our relationship with God. Um, our, the, the basis of fellowship is, is, is what brings purpose to our relationship, is what helps us to utilize uh, the advantage of being connected with God. And that's really what intimacy and prayer is all about. And that's what we want to discuss. I'll read two scriptures for us and then we'll begin. Let's start by reading Matthew chapter 7, verses 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7. And Jesus said, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. Now we are going to take out and emphasize on the phrase seek 
and you will find because we're talking about finding God in prayer. And Jesus gave us three aspects of prayer that um, every believer who prays would surely um, interface with. He says, ask. This has to do with tendering our supplications to God. He says, seek. This has to do with uh, getting to know more of God. Uh, the part of prayer that brings you into deeper intimacy with God. You seek something because you need it. And then knock. And it has to do with our perseverance in prayer and how that we can enforce our God-given dominion to see how through prayer we can transport things from the realm of the spirit into the physical. So these are three aspects of prayer that every believer will interface with. It's either you are asking or you are seeking or you are knocking at any time when you pray. But we want to deal with the place of seeking. Seeking. Now, God is a spirit. And being a spirit, he dwells in a frame of reference that is spiritual. In other words, invisible to the human eye. And so if we must know God, we must know him within the frame of his reference. We must know him within the context of his civilization. That means that our knowledge of God will push us to explore the realm of the spirit that where God is. And I, I, and I, I, I find it difficult to say where God is because, you know, everything... <laughs> I can't say God is somewhere. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. But the Bible tells us that he dwells in the heavens. He said, the heavens are my throne and the earth is my footstool. So the frame of reference where God is, um, where God exists and where God manifests from is the realm of the spirit. And so in order to know him, we must seek him in that realm. So we are talking about seeking knowledge of something that is spiritual. That's why I said we're dealing with finding God in prayer. So Jesus said we should seek and we will find. That means if we don't seek, if we don't go on an expedition, if we don't, by the help of the Holy Spirit, explore the realm of the Spirit, we will not find substantial knowledge of God that will increase us in our intimate relationship with him. Second scripture, Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. Um, one scripture that I love so much. Verses 11, 12, 13, and 14. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen. Now, the reason why is bringing the issue of prayer in verse 12 is because God has something that we need. God has something that our destiny is connected to. He says, I know the thoughts I think towards you and these thoughts are to give you a future. But then God says, for you to know that future, you must call upon me and pray to me and I will listen to you. First, the thing gets it more interesting. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. Now, verse 14 actually is the future that God intended for the nation of Israel that he was giving this prophetic word to through Jeremiah the prophet. That I will bring you back from captivity, I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. This was the future that God intended for his people. But God says, in order for them to plunge into this future, he says that they must seek him in prayer. They must seek him and find me. They find him. And he says the only way that they can seek him and find him is when they search with the whole of their heart. 
that means there is a heart component in prayer now when we talked about transformation by prayer we discussed the first level of transformation was the heart uh, stage it means that whatever prayer does to your heart is what will affect your life uh, the state of your heart is what determines the change around your life and so you see that prayer god um, discerns it based on the state of our heart so prayer is more of a heart thing because your heart is the core aspect of your being that's where your reality comes from that's where your perception comes from that's where your knowing about life comes from that's where conviction is built that's where faith uh, that's where faith comes into so when you seek God with the whole of our heart, it's because you're convinced that when you seek Him, you will find Him. And for you to develop an intimate relationship with God, you must find Him. Not like God is really far from us. That's what Acts chapter uh, 17 verse 28 says. In Him we live, we move, and have our being. In verse 27 it says that uh, with the hope that we will seek Him, for he is not far from us. Not that God is far from us, but God decides to hide himself from us. In other words, he decides to, by default, make the knowledge of himself vague to humans. Why? So that the anxiety, the curiosity that is in us to want to know something that is beyond the mundane will be triggered and it will push us into a search, into an, a desperate expedition to know more of God. In Proverbs 25 verse 2, the Bible says that it is the glory of kings, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it is the glory of kings to search it out. So God hides things by putting them in himself. Now for you to find those things, they must be revealed to you. But you see, revelations come from God by His Spirit, but they are reactions to a deliberate action of searching into God, of seeking after God, of pursuing the knowledge of God. So, and God has put that in our hearts so that we can desperately go on a search for God, so that we can go on a quest to seek God, to get to know Him, and then he begins to open up layers of revelations to us, bringing a revelation of himself to us. And you know, the more of God you know, is the more of yourself you get to know. Is the more of your identity you get to discover. And the more of God you know, is the more transformation that you will receive. Because the Bible says, as we behold him, we are changed. So God wants us to seek him God wants us to find Him in prayer. That's how intimacy is developed. When a young man wants to get married, he doesn't just go at random and pick anybody on the street. No. His heart seeks after someone he is connected to. And then he begins to go after that person to get that person. Every day of our lives, we are looking for something. It's either you're looking for food, or your daily sustenance, or you are looking for comfort. We are, do everything we do, we are on the pursuit for something. Why don't we give time to pursue God? Why don't we give time to seek God, to search after Him? He's waiting to be found by us. But before we really talk about intimacy uh, in prayer i would want us i want us to get a background of what prayer really is let's try some broad spectrum definitions about prayer so that we can all understand and then we'll narrow it down to the place of intimacy and discuss further how you can build your relationship with god how you can become more intimate with god and the advantages, the benefits that hold sway on such a quest. What is prayer? 
I'd like you to listen to this definition I will give to you. Prayer is a spiritual law that governs the system of communication and interaction between the realm of the spirit and the earth. A spiritual law that governs the system of communication and interaction between the realm of the spirit and the earth. So there are things you need to know. It's first of all a spiritual law. That means this law is domiciled in the realm of the spirit. There are laws that control realms. A realm is an area of activity. In the physical realm, there are laws that control this physical realm. And anything that must be established in the physical must work in accordance with these laws. For instance, there is a law of gravity that there is a force that pulls every body or object to the center of the earth. That's why everything that goes up will come down to the surface of the earth. So also there are spiritual laws and these laws govern the realms that we get to explore in the spirit. It governs the system of communication and interaction between the realm of the spirit and the physical. So if there must be an interaction between these two realms, the realm of the intangible and the tangible, the spirit and the physical, the heavens and the earth, the supernatural and the natural, then prayer must be engaged because prayer is the law that bridges the gap of communication and interaction between these bo both realms. And so prayer is really, really an important phenomenon. I'll give you these four things about prayer, four aspects that define prayer uh, before we are done with this episode today. Prayer is number one. Talking with God, that's intimacy. Prayer is talking with God, that's intimacy. And I'd like you to know that friendship is created through spending time. Time and attention are the ingredients for creating friendship. Intimacy is, 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 is really about friendship. It's really about becoming so close with a person. So, number one, prayer is talking with God. Notice I said talking with, not talking to. Because if we said to, it's a one-way system of communication. But if we say with, it's a two-way, a dual carriage system of communication. So we talk to God and He talks back to us. That means we must have the ability to perceive what He's saying as well as knowing what to say to Him per time. Number two, prayer is hearing from God. Revelation. Prayer is hearing from God. Revelation. Your ability to perceive what God is saying. How He's saying it. Sometimes it comes in pictures. God can say something to you and it produces a picture. God can be speaking to you, but what you are seeing is a vision. Now, the Bible says in Habakkuk chapter 2 from verse 1, it says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon my tower and watch to see what he will say. How do you see what he said? Visions. And vision is an aspect of divine revelations. So that's why we must understand the aspect of prayer as hearing from God. Sometimes when you hear from God, it may be in form of a vision, a dream. It may be in form of a counsel through a human um, representative of God. It may be in form of an understanding that you receive. Prayer is hearing from God. Number three, prayer is pleading or standing before God. Prayer is pleading with God on behalf of others or standing before God on behalf of others. I don't know how you're going to write it, but I believe you understand it. It's pleading or standing before God on behalf of others. All right? This is intercession. Sometimes we are talking to God concerning people. Maybe we are making a request on their behalf. 
or we are making a petition to God on their behalf. Or sometimes we are standing before God on behalf of people. You see, the difference between both is when you are pleading with God on behalf of a person, uh, it's, a, it's a function of your initiative. Perhaps they are in need of help. Perhaps uh, they are in need of the mercy of God or they need divine intervention. And then you go before God and maybe they are already disadvantaged in their right standing with God. And so you go before God and begin to plead with him. Just like Abraham did with God in Genesis chapter um, 18, I believe, when God was going to destroy Sodom. Abraham told God, he says, shall a righteous God slay the righteous and the wicked? He said, you will do no such thing. So if you find 50 people, will you spare them? God said, I will spare. If I have 50 righteous people, I will spare the city. He said, if you have 45 righteous people, God said, I will spare the city if there are 45 righteous people. Speaking about the remnant phenomenon. So it is the remnant of the righteous that preserves the world that we live in. And then Abraham continued the bargain until he came to 10. That is pleading with God. But standing before God, it may, it may be you taking the initiative or it may be God initiating it through you. Now, when you read Genesis 19, the Bible says that when God began to destroy Sodom, that Abraham rose up early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before God. He was still making petitions to God to spare Sodom for Lot's sake, Lot, his nephew. So he had to stand before God. And really, when you begin to plunge into the depths of intercession, you will understand what it means to stand before God. There's a scripture in Psalms that says, Come bless the Lord, O servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. God is in need of men and women that can stand for a generation, that can stand before God to preserve his heritage, to preserve the move of his spirit, to see to it that the oracles of God received from the fathers are delivered to the next generation. You know, I watched a preacher saying something uh, just yesterday that witches and wizards uh, in, the, in, in the demonic world know how to fly or astral project to their meetings. It has been like that years ago. It is still like that today. So they know how to explore the supernatural uh, in their favor. But it looks like there are miracles or there are things that God did that we read in the Bible or we read in church history that are no longer happening now. Perhaps it is because we have not received the oracles that the fathers had. So God needs men that will stand before him well enough to receive from God stature and authority and bring about a change, a revival in a generation. And then finally, prayer is contending against opposing forces contending against opposes, opposing forces. This is spiritual warfare. So I gave you four things. Number one, I said prayer is talking with God, which is intimacy. Number two, prayer is hearing from God, which is revelation. Number three, prayer is pleading or standing before God on behalf of others, which is intercession. And number four, prayer is contending against opposing forces, which is warfare. Intimacy, revelation, intercession, warfare. These are the four aspects that purely define a healthy prayer life for a believer. In the next episode, we will zoom in to discuss further on the aspect of intimacy. I'd like you to like this video and subscribe if it is your first time. Watch it again and again and I pray that God will inspire you. I pray that God will teach you by His Spirit beyond what you have learned. In Jesus' name. You don't want to miss the next episode because we're going to go really deep till I come your way again. God bless you. And keep exploring the school of the Spirit. Thank you.